you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to shout. Peter declared to him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Truly, I say to you, this very night, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go yonder and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled, and he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he came to the disciples and found them, sleeping, and said to Peter, So, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed. My father, if this Unless I drink it, I will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. And he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking rest? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sin. Rise, let us be going to see by the trail. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, why are you here? Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword.
Bible studies. And when I knew I was preaching on the Bible, I thought, well, I'm proceeding thy strong word, no questions asked. Because it just makes sense. And then as we were singing, I said, oh, this song has hallelujahs in it. And we're not supposed to do that during lunch, but we just did. So um, you can blame me for that one. So um, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. If you want to get out your bulletin, you can do that. There's three verses um, that the sermon will be uh, based on. And as I was telling you, I was thinking about this sermon, and uh, Pastor Lee and I had met a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about the different uh, windows and things. And I was excited to have the Bible, to, to be able to preach on the Bible. And then I started preparing for my sermon, and I was telling Bible study class this morning, I did a simple text, uh, our Google search, just about the Bible, or the you know, and to see how many times God's word comes up or something similar to that in the actual Bible. Okay. And I was blown away. I said, Well, I have a lot of choices. I've got to narrow this down, as oftentimes sermons come together. So I've narrowed it down to those three texts. But when, when I talk about the Bible, or I've heard people talk about the Bible, they always say, Well, it's kind of intimidating. The Bible's so big, it's, it's a huge book. Uses language we don't always use, and when, what I want you to think about is the Bible is that it all points us to Jesus, right? When, when, when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, God promises a Savior, and from that time forward, everything in the Bible points us to Jesus and it points us to Him. And then everything after that points us back to Jesus, and it points us back to his death and his resurrection. And so when we read through the Bible, that's a good way to help you remember when you're getting lost in some of the laws, of the, the Levitical laws, or you're in the Old Testament, there's tons of history of kings that are good and bad. You remember the overarching theme of the Bible is that it's God's love story to us, his, his plan of salvation, and especially his message of Jesus Christ. And when we think about it, the Bible is not just one really thick book, it's actually 66 books. Now I see confirmation students, I'm not going to ask you, but you should know how many books are in the Old Testament. 39 is the answer to that, in case you were wondering. Um, and then, of course, in the New Testament, there are 27 books that, that come from, that make up our Bible. And most of the ones in the New Testament are written by the Apostle Paul. Over a majority of those books are written by him. But as, um, as we look at the Bible, there's a few key verses that I want to focus on that I, that I picked for tonight. The first one comes from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. And it says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The first word that jumps up to me is living. The Bible is living. It's active, it says. Think about when God creates man and he breathes into him the breath of life. That's what the Bible is like. It reminds us of the life that God gives to us. It reminds us of his plan for salvation. It reminds us that we are alive because of him. He gives us life. And it's active, it says. It's effective in what it does. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And I don't know a lot about swords, but this sword it talks about in this verse, it talks about piercing the soul. That's what the Bible does when we read the Bible and we think about God's word. Many times we, we read it and we realize, oh, I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness. But then there's other times where we read it and we say, oh, man, God loves me so much. This is an amazing, amazing reminder for me in this moment to remind myself of God's promise. And so the, the Bible works that way. It cuts to our soul. It cuts into us. And it reminds us that we have a God who loves us. And, and, and sent his son to die for us. 
Lasting, it discerns the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. So I'm not sure. God's word exposes the true state of yeah, the person's heart. Sure. When we look and we read God's word, we can see where we're at. And sometimes, like I said, we remember that we are sinful, we're selfish sometimes. We think things we shouldn't think or do things that we shouldn't do. And it reminds us of our need for our seed. It also has that power of the gospel that reminds us of our Savior. Mm -hmm. It reminds us of the love that Jesus has for us. In fact, the writer of Hebrews goes on in chapter 4, and he says later in that chapter, he says, For we have a great high priest, Jesus, who, who was tempted just as we were, yet he was without sin. And so we can approach the throne of grace and we can go to Jesus with confidence, knowing that he was tempted just as we are, and that he was without sin. And did it without sin. So we can approach him, knowing that he will hear our prayers, and knowing that he knows what it's like to be tempted, just as we are tempted. The second verse comes from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. Through 17. Paul is writing to the to Timothy. He's mentoring Timothy as a young pastor. Paul is older at this stage of his life, and he's mentoring young Timothy. And he says this, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. There's a lot in just this one chap, this one, these few verses here. And so Paul knew that Timothy had his mother and his grandmother who passed their faith along to him. And many of you sitting in this room have children or grandchildren who you have passed that faith along. Or you've passed the faith along to friends at school. Or you pass it along to people who you come into contact with. You see, we pass that word of God along to the next people, knowing that this, this story of Jesus has gone on long before us. And it will go on long after. It's an amazing thing to think that thousands of years ago we knew about, we know about a guy who was crucified and died for our sins. Think of all the faithful people who have shared that story along the lines, and especially the faithful people in your lives who have come to you and shared their faith with you. Pass that faith along. We give thanks to God for those people who have shared that faith with us. But it goes on. It says, God words teaches us about salvation through Jesus Christ. Scripture is breathed out. Again, it's, it gives life. When God breathes, he gives life. And, and that's what the scriptures, it, it has life. And it teaches us. It teaches us law and gospel. It teaches us the things that we do wrong, the law, the, the things that God expects of us. But it, it also teaches us the gospel. It teaches us about the love that Jesus the love of Jesus Christ that God poured out through him. It's good for reproof and correction. We all need that reminder of, of, of our sinfulness. The, the law works in, in three ways, and hopefully you guys remember this as well up there in the back. That the, the law works as a curb. It keeps us on, on the, the straight and narrow. It works as a mirror. It shows us the sins that we've committed. Lastly, it works as a guide to guide us in our everyday life. That's what the law does. It, it reminds us to stay on the right track. It shows us that we're sinners. And it shows us how to live our life. It works as a guide to guide us to how we're supposed to live. And then the gospel shows us our Savior. It shows us Jesus' love and it reminds us of the love he has for us. But then, at the end, it talks about how the Bible is good because it, it's, it's good for training and righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good word. 
You see, when we learn about the law and the gospel, we learn about our, our, our sinfulness, and we learn about our Savior, we learn that we're, our sins are forgiven, and that there's nothing that can ever separate us from God's love. Well, then it's then that we do our good works. We're reminded that we do good works to show people God's love, to show, to show them the, the love that Jesus has for us. And we overflow with that love. Because, not because it earns us our way to heaven, but because of, it's God's love coming to us. And out of that love, we respond and we say, I want to do the best I can do for Jesus Christ. And it's not any way that we earn our salvation, but we do that because of our love is poured out, and it poured out to us, and it flows out to other people. Lastly, Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever. The word of God will stand forever. The grass, the grass withers and the flowers fade. We're looking forward to spring here in, in Minnesota. At least most of us are anyway. Uh, we're looking forward to those days when the grass will grow and there will be flowers. And, and we're reminded of the growth that comes in the springtime. But then the fall comes and winter comes. And the grass will fade and the flowers will die. And see, we live in a world, especially right now, where fear kind of overtakes things, right? We worry about death. We worry about sickness right now. It's a big story. The coronavirus is a big story. And how do we deal with it? How do we best deal with it? And in that, we have, we're fearing because we can't control it. And we want to be like God and we want to take control of it. And God says, the grass withers and the flower fades, but my word will stand forever. You see, we stand on God's promises in times when we're afraid. We stand on the promise of knowing that he's present with us. Knowing that Jesus Christ walked on the earth just like we do. That he was here, present in the earthly form as God and as man. That he was fully present and he knows what it's like to see people die. To see people be afraid. When his friend Lazarus died, he or when his friend Lazarus died, he cried with his sister. With Lazarus' sister. He knows what it's like to feel pain and to, to know what it's like to, to have the earthly troubles that we have. And so we remember his promise that he was always with us. We remember his promise that he will never, that there's nothing that can ever separate us from God's love. Romans chapter 8 tells us that. That there's neither height nor depth nor angels nor demons nor things present nor to come, nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation that will ever separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We cling to those promises in times when we're afraid. Lastly, we look and we remember God's word stands forever. Here's my challenge to you tonight. We, I don't know how many days, I thought I was going to count and I forgot. It was kind of a crazy day for me today. Um, but you, have, you can read through Mark, the Gospel of Mark. You can read one chapter a day. You can easily finish that before Mark is over. Luke has 24 chapters. John has 22. Matthew has 28. You can read one chapter a day and read the whole story of Jesus' life. And probably be done by Easter. Now, I can't tell you that for sure because I don't know for sure. But you get the idea. You may have to read two in one day. I think you can handle that. Read the Bible because it's living, it's active, it cuts deeper than any two edged sword. I don't encourage you to read the Bible to give you one more thing to do. I encourage you to read the Bible because it's God's love that comes through in that story. And there might be things that you don't understand, and there might be things that are confusing. Ask your pastor, especially Pastor Lee. He's really great at answering questions. <laughs> I'm not always that great. I kind of make my way, make my way through it eventually. But read through the box, read through one of the gospel stories, and see the love that Jesus Christ poured out for you. We're reading about it in sixth grade confirmation right now, and, and it's amazing to think the, the amount of sacrifice Jesus made for us because He loves us. And so we remember that, and we remember his promises, that he'll always be with us, that he'll never leave us or forsake us, that he loves us, and one day we will live with him forever.
name of Jesus Christ, our hope and our Savior. Amen. We continue by singing our next two, which is Jesus loves me.
through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Almighty God, grant to your church your Holy Spirit and the wisdom that comes down from above, that your word may not be bound, but have free course and be preached to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, that in steadfast faith, we may serve you, and in the confession of your name, abide unto the end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Almighty Father, giver and perfecter of our faith, send your blessing upon the word which has been spoken to us, and by your Holy Spirit, increase our saving knowledge of you, and that we may remain steadfast in your grace. Give us strength to fight the good faith, and by faith, to over, overcome all the temptations of Satan. Through the, flood, love, through the flesh, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Gracious Lord, we give you thanks for the day, especially for the good we were permitted to give and to receive. The day is now past, and we commit it to you. We, we entrust to you the night and rest in your peace, for you are our help, and you neither slumber nor sleep. Gracious Lord, bless our evenings through Jesus Christ our Lord. O God, from whom all holy desires and all, all good counsels and all just works give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give that our hearts may be set to your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
those last seven words. Um, so check those out. And also, there's a used book sale. If you want to grab a book and pass that along, you can do that. Lastly, because of uh, the fear of passing things along, I'll stand in the back if you want to bump elbows or give a high forearm. Or I don't, I've even seen people tap their feet if you want to do that. If you want to shake hands, we can do that too. So it's up to you how to let you do that. Thank <laughs> you.